Hello everyone, so I'm Maya and today I will be giving the presentation on Julia Nordegraff's strategies of display and she focuses on museum presentation in 19th and 20th century visual culture and she specifically chooses an arts museum that has a long rich history of over 200 years. It was once the Taylor Museum in based in Harlem and then it um, integrated into the uh, Bohemians Museum in Rotterdam and it this museum became a very important landmark structure in the 19th century urban culture of Rotterdam. So um, we study, we are going to look through how um, the author studies this museum and presents her arguments. So this is the index of my presentation. The first part of my presentation, I will showcase a, a timeline of the museum and how it has developed over the years. I will explain um, the major and important transitions that have taken place and how the museum has shifted form from um, exhibitions and demonstrations. Um, the next part of the presentation, I will choose to look at key fragments of the text that are there to support the author's arguments as she leads us through her article. And um, after that, I will also open up a space for discussion and um, encourage everyone to think about these, um, the discussion points that I have listed. Because throughout the article, there are points where the author brings forth counter arguments and she explains why she rejects or believes in the opposite of these arguments and I think this is a very valuable ground for um, discussion and debate. I think um, it can encourage us to look at a lot of different perspectives of an argument and also um, the author herself says that some of her analysis and interpretations are um, subjective so we also hold this opportunity to present our subjective views in the discussion board so my last uh, my last section in uh, my presentation is uh, my reflection of the main theme so I put together the three arguments that I have concluded from um, the author's article and I um, put these together into a main argument that I um, interpret her article to present and the last part is the bibliography so now we will continue to um, start the presentation so the author Julia Nordegraft opens her story, her introduction part, with an explanation of the timeline of this museum that she has chosen to conduct her study. This information is important because it then guides us to understand her arguments that she presents forth. So we have a background understanding the historical context, the historical setting of this museum and also of the social climate that this museum was in when it transitioned over the years. So, in the year 1784, the museum was still pr used primarily as a demonstration space with large pieces, with this large piece of furniture in the center so people could study drawings inside. And then 20 years later, the, this space transitioned into an exhibition space and in the center the instruments can now be seen behind glass doors so this is a very important year of transition because the space changes from a demonstration space to an exhibition space so in 1839 the, mu the museum staff must have realized they needed to take precautions to protect the art objects and the visitors were kept out at appropriate distances with iron barriers. And then in 1850, this was also an important year because um, the author 
informed us that in the、uh, early eighteenth century, in the Netherlands, the art society was still owned by was still very privately owned by people of high status that had private art collections, but now. Um, this man, a very renowned、uh, lawyer,、um, Bohemians, he offered to bequeath his collection and made the city's first public museum.、Um, it was opened in prime location on a principal shopping street in Rotterdam, and this changed the social climate of art, the art society, from private to public ownership, and it enriched the artistic heritage of Rotterdam. In nineteen in nineteen hundred. A curator, Wilhelm von Bode, transitioned this museum from a densely packed room, from its densely packed rooms to elegant, balanced period room displays. And thirty-five years later, the mu the museum、um, witnessed a lot of curators from in in the Netherlands and outside, helping it transition. And now it consists of a clear layout, light and sober galleries, and innovative systems of lighting. And this is why the museum hailed as a landmark in modern museum design nationally and internationally, because it has own it owns a very innovative system of curating. So in this slide, I've attached some of the images that the author included, and this helps to give you a visual、um, guide of how the museum's transitioned, and you can see、um, that. From the very beginning, that there, it was a space of demonstration and collaboration. You could handle with the objects, and then it gradually becomes a space of exhibition, where you can only see the objects through glass cases or on the boards, behind the railings. So I will move on to the first argument that I have gathered from the article. And、um, it is in our contemporary media-saturated society, objects such as museums become emblematic visual regimes that can influence and shape our views on the world, and at the same time represent reflections of our cultural environment and historical development. And the quote that I have selected to explain this is、um, film historian Vanessa Schwartz. And、uh, she comments on how、uh, media confrontation nowadays、uh, constructs reality in different forms. The museum, however, is one of these constructions that can, in many ways, reflect and represent visually、um, this reality that we live in. And the author finds this very important to include because an analysis of museum presentation is providing us with insight into the ways that we interpret our world around us and、um, the manner that we communicate about it. And the walking into a museum, everything everything that beholds before you is that way of reflecting and interpreting the world. So my second argument is the museum, a presentation of complex construction, is a product of both designer and user, as well as a ground that encourages different narratives of subjective interpretation. And I have selected two quotes. The first one is、uh, Latour and Akrich's notion of the script. So the author also. Shares this notion of the script. Basically, it is、um, a museum. The entity of a museum is like a script, and how Latour and Akrich they they present it. They explain this is、um, they say. The museum representation, museum presentations are the product of both its designers and its users. Be it that these users often remain hip hypothetical entities, ideal types implicit in the museum's galleries. So what this means is that. Just like having a script is like being given a set of instructions, the viewers who go into the museum is actually presented with an implied、um, set of instructions of how to conduct their、um, visits.
in the museum and how to, you know, make their way around the objects that are presented. The second quote that I have chosen is um, Eileen Hooper Green Hills argument and she says that the museums should reflect on the preferences knowledges and emotions of their different visitor groups and arrange their displays in a way that allows different narratives to coexist in the post museum many voices are heard so what this is trying to say is that um, we should encourage subjectivity so even at the same time there's this implied script this implied instruction we should also take into account that there will be many, many different um, groups of visitors. They, They are very diverse and we should allow different narratives to coexist. We should ensure that the museum is a place that encourages subjectivity. The third argument I have concluded is the political effects generated by the museum is not a direct effect effect of the selection arrangement and description by the museum staff but operated in between the interpretations of the staff and the public. The quote I have selected is um, Nordegraff's her own argument saying, although I acknowledge that visual regimes have political effects, I do not see these effects as direct results of deliberate intentions on the part of the museum staff. In my view, those effects are by definition inherent to the visual regime of the museum and operated in between the museum staff and the public. So what the author is trying to say is that she does not believe the museum staff have this kind of conspiracy theory power um, that she says in her article. She says she doesn't believe the officials have the power to regulate visitors and how they interpret um, these objects like puppets on a string. She doesn't believe the museum has this power. She thinks Uh, She considers these visitors as active agents who are able to, um, by their physical presence, behavior and viewing habits, have an active role in shaping the museum space. So that is her take on the political effect of the museum and that the power, the um, museum staff do not have this overbearing Um, authoritarian power over the um, visitors interpretations so in this slide I have provided everyone with some points of discussion because um, while reading her text I have realized that she places a lot of um, scholar arguments forward as a sort of foreshadowing of her own so she places Carol Duncan forward and Um, Carol Duncan's argument is that visitors are passive victims to a museum regime and they are prompt to enact a performance of some kind. Yet, however, um, the author really doesn't agree with her uh, view. She believes that visitors are active agents shaping um, the museum interpretations. They they bring in a lot of their own individuality and subjectivity into interpreting this museum space. And so I I want you to think about, so where do you stand on this question of viewer's place? Are they passive victims or active agents? So maybe connect to your own museum um, experiences, how you feel the museum. This might even differ with different museums that they have different ways of curating that make you a different viewer. So my second point is um, the author also presents Hooper Greenhill's views on political effects and um, we just talked about this in the third argument and basically Hooper Greenhill believes that the power of the staff is the regulating power in a museum. She thinks that um, the staff because they can select arrange and um, curate the descriptions of the objects they hold the interpretation power over the 
audience. However, the author rebuttals this and says she believes that the、um, political effects and these definitions of the objects are operated in between the museum staff and the public. So, what do you think? What do you think、um, about the power of the political effect, and where does that lie? So this slide is my main argument that I have、um, summarized and concluded after reflecting from my three arguments that I have concluded from the text, and it is the museum an influential and reflective emblematic visual regime is a product of both the designer as a thoughtful constructor and the user as an active agent. The political effect of the museum object is operated in between the interpretations of the museum staff and the public.、Um, this slide is my bibliography slide. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the discussion space. I hope everyone is taking care of themselves in these challenging and unprecedented times, and and yeah. Have a nice day.